Good evening, everyone. Um, so let's kick off. This is a welcome to Winemaker session number one. Um, the first one, and I said to Aubrey on Tuesday when we first spoke, um, we're starting it with a three times international winemaker of the year. So I'm not sure how I'm going to top this. I might need to get um, Michael Jordan or someone on. Um, I don't know how I'll get any better than this, but um, first a bit of housekeeping. So I can see I've got Craig on the right there. I've got Ryan. They're all they're all watching from Ryan from Cape Town. I've got another person from Surrey. So welcome everyone online. Um, housekeeping first of all. Tonight's winemaker session is sponsored by Women's Chapter. Women's Chapter is a movement for high impact women in business to connect, inspire, and thrive. So if you'd like to find out more, just head over to www.womenschapter.com. That's W-O-M-E-N-S chapter.com for more info. Um, other housekeeping, you can pop your information or questions down on the chat session. Um, Aubrey and I'll be able to see that and then I'll drag the questions onto the screen so we can answer them as we go through. Probably the most important part of the housekeeping this evening is charge your glasses. Um, I'm very lucky to have a glass of the Beerslau Pilotage 2018 year. And I hope many, many other people who are listening have the same. Um, and Aubrey can give us a little bit more insight into that. Um, so kick back and enjoy this. Um, quick background on Aubrey. Um, I'll give you a short synopsis. Um, Aubrey started his first vintage at Cunningham Corp in 2002, and I was very lucky to visit it um, just around that time. Um, I arrived with long hair and baggies and flip flops, and Cunningham Corp and the guys there were so 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 amazing. They took us up into the barrel cellar, which I, I believe at the time, Aubrey, am I right? Is it above the tasting room? That's so, right. Yeah, so it took us upstairs, which was, confused me, first of all, because I thought a cellar was downstairs. Um, the, and we tasted some amazing wines out of the, out of the barrels themselves. Um, and ever since then, Cannon Corp's been really close to my heart. And I think when I got back to the, the wine shop floor in London, I sold quite a bit of Cannon Corp for you. So uh, it worked well. But I hope after tonight, Beerslaw will be as close to, close to everyone's heart as, as Cannon Corp was to me then. So it's 7 p.m. our time here in the UK. You can see it's dark with me, and I think it's 9 p.m. with you, Aubrey. Um, yeah, it's 9 still o'clock. It's still about 25 degrees Celsius outside. <laughs> so, uh, the, brief was, the brief was not to mention the weather, okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, but you, you, on Tuesday when we spoke, you said you'll most likely still be bringing grapes in. So how, how's the harvest going? Yeah, we, we finished up around... Uh, about 6.30 with, with the last grapes that we received and the, the guys just finished cleaning the, all the equipment about half an hour ago. But the punch downs will, will go on throughout the night, every two hours. So we just come in from 8 o'clock and then 10 o'clock we'll be back at it. And you're talking about punch downs, Aubrey. I think um, to give a bit of visibility to the people that are on this, on the chacha, you guys use um, open open tank fermentation don't you so it's sort of a, it's a two meter about two meter one and a half meter deep tank is that right yeah it's uh, i think one of the of the cornerstones of the wine that we make is is definitely the open top ferments um you know one of the reasons that people don't use it nowadays um, as much is it's quite labor intensive um and it was also quite a struggle for us to figure out you know even with this with the social distancing stuff how to to get you know, get it done with uh, um, this, you know, this this time with, with COVID and all. Um, but yeah, so it's open top ferment. It's about uh, five meters long, two and a half wide, and one point two deep. So it looks like a smallish uh, swimming pool or splash pool or something like that. But yeah, there's such a lot of benefits. Um, you know, when, when we redid the cellar in 2016, we actually just doubled up in our open top concrete fermentation capacity uh, because we believe strongly in, 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 in the style that we can produce uh, with, with these fermenters. A lot of the, a lot of the guys that I've spoken to are talking about concrete eggs. You know, I think that, that that fermentation vessel, what do you see the benefit is on the open tank fermenters versus those concrete eggs? Yeah, it's uh, well, the, the concrete is mainly for the whites, you know, the, the ferments that take place uh, inside, inside those tanks and the way that it mixes up the lease. Um, it's not the same with, with the open uh, tanks for uh, the reds. Um, so, but the benefits are definitely oxygen, getting oxygen in during the fermentation. You know, it's, it's a very reductive, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, 
the, the fermenting must, must is very reductive, so it's very difficult to get oxygen. And you can imagine something that's creating carbon dioxide the whole time. Um, to get oxygen mixed in there is quite difficult, but we do get it right with these open top concrete fermenters. And also, um, the, because it's quite a quite a shallow fermenter, uh, it has a wide, quite a wide space, uh, and, and, and and we, we talk about the cap that's quite thin. So in the fermentation starts, the skins will rise to the top. So if you have quite a shallow tank, the, the, the cap is not as thick. So there's always a good surface area in contact between the skins and the juice, uh, which is great. Um, then also we lose up to half a percent of alcohol due to evaporation, uh, which is another benefit. And just in general, it's a much less reductive type of uh, fermentation. So as soon as you start moving the wine or the, the, the mass at that point after ferment, you start to to get rid of the carbon dioxide and you start to incorporate oxygen in the in, in the fermenting mass. And that's a that's a big benefit. Um, I think that got lost over the years as people focus on you know new technology. Um, you, you move away from things that have, you, have worked in the past um, to to rather focus on on efficiency and you know saving electricity, you know, saving on labor and time, etc. So a lot of a lot of development in the wine business over the years have not solely focused on quality, rather on on making the whole process more efficient. And the um, you're talking about the punching of the caps and that down on you know on the open tank fermenters. The how does how does pinotage differ in how you got to handle it through fermentation and production versus something like Cabernet or Merlot or you know some of the more traditional varieties? Yeah, you know that's a question. I I think we uh, if I really go in depth, we can run you know, run out of time. But uh, I think that is uh, um, you know something that we saw. Uh, trying to figure out, uh, I think we understand much more than we did 10 or 20 years ago. But, you know, when you, when you compare Burgundy to Bordeaux, that's the same type of, of question, you know, what is so different? And, and we know what the difference is, but how to handle that difference? Uh, you know, 30, 40 years ago, you know, red fruit in South Africa was managed more or less the same. It was was almost a recipe of how to make the, the wine. And when Pinotage became more popular, it was uh, um, you know, it was it was difficult for people to understand this varietal. Firstly, because there's no like uh, uh, benchmark that you can go back to, um, and a lot of the mistakes that was made in the early days was due to not understanding the varietal and how to handle it, how to manage uh, the fruit. So what uh, what we've seen is that Pinotage is a is, it's a, firstly it's an early ripening variety, and um, it has quite a thick skin, um, thicker than Shiraz or Merlot. Um, it has uh, uh, it ripens very very quickly, so the time from veraison for picking is, is almost half the time compared to Cabernet Sauvignon. It ferments very very fast. Uh, that's also a challenge because you. To, to manage your temperature, to manage your extraction in a very short period of time is, is quite challenging. Uh, it has a high pH, so it's more prone to bacterial spoilage if you don't manage your, your, your pH um, carefully during the, the fermentation process, you can, have, you can mess it up. Um, and because it ripens quite quickly, you struggle with you know what people call phenolic ripeness. It's also like the holy grail when it comes to cooking wine making you know, the, what is knowledge is how to reach it. So, uh, so we, we understand a lot of these things much better today. So the way that we manage pinotage is very different from other varietals. And we focus our, our the main thing is to focus your extraction in the first part of the fermentation before the alcohol goes goes to high. As soon as the alcohol goes up during the ferment, then your 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 the solution changes in the way that you can extract and what you can extract out of the skins the pups. Uh, changes as well, so you can end up with a much more aggressive wine that you like, or what your your, your consumer would like. So uh, you have to manage that process very very carefully. You mentioned you mentioned uh, getting an aggressive wine from that. Um, I remember, I mean, when I used to work on the shop floors, and I used to have people come and ask me about, you know, I want a wine that tastes like this, and I want a wine that smells like that. Um, I think everyone is subjective, and I think some of the early days of, you know, when 
some of the British critics used to talk about pinotaurs. They used to talk about rusty nails and weird names like that. Um, you, you obviously with the open tank fermentation, you taste the juice directly from that tank, don't you? Yeah. So um, we what, taste, are, what are you looking for there? We try to taste. Uh, you know, the first part uh, is not that important. The first, uh, I would say, the third of fermentation is not all that important. But in the middle part, that's when it becomes really important. So. What we want is mouthfeel, mid palate structure without too much harsh, aggressive tannins. Um, and harsh meaning, um, you know, something that's not ripe. You can you can get beautiful, big structure, big tannins in some vintages. That's it's, it's it's still it's still grainy but smooth. It's not it's not uh, unpleasant. But once you get to the point where you feel, listen, this tannin will be too too much or too aggressive for the style of wine we want to make when we, when we slack down on the punch down we'll go rather for for four or six hour intervals instead of two hour intervals um, but the whole thing is just to give you an idea we picked we picked on tuesday um, this fruit and we probably already press it by tomorrow or the day after so it's really fast okay. um, so your, your window period of extraction and getting it right and uh, it's much shorter than other varieties, so you you have to. You know, it's quite intense, and and that's why we do twenty four hours a day, and and try to get it absolutely right. I was going to ask, is it twenty four hours a day? That's pretty um, that's pretty intense. <laughs> Just keep going. Um, when when we look at obviously you make um, I think someone mentioned and they quote I might be wrong, but I'm sure someone will come back on the chat and tell me if this quote is wrong. But I think they said Arby doesn't make just one of South Africa's greatest pinotages, he makes three. So that kind of brings us on to your, your beer slot pinotage. So you make these other ones under the Cunnicorp label, you know, from the state pinotage and the black label, and your beer slot pinotage itself. What's different in the beer slot pinotage versus the Cunnicorp ones? Yeah, it's, uh, I, you know, um, I, I also said in the past, you know, this this I didn't find the wine, the wine, the wine actually found me, or the vineyard found me, and, and the way it developed was not a, and, and I, I truly believe that's the right way for any wine to to evolve is from from the soil upwards. You know, it mustn't be a boardroom type of uh, decision how I want to make or what I want to make, and it must come from the from the soil. So um, I got introduced to this vineyard about probably close to 20 years ago um, and worked with it a couple of times and then in 20 around 2010 2011 the idea of showcasing a uh, different face of pinotage you know started in my head and um, and, and I'm, I'm going to explain why because in, at Canon Corp I work only with decomposed granite soils um, from this property um, and, and the expression of decomposed granites are normally quite big structured, um, you know, more dark fruit, plums, yeah. uh, current, uh, dark chocolate, that type of characteristics. And, uh, and for, for, you know, I think people that, that know Canon uh, uh, will recognize those characteristics. Um, so when I worked with this vineyard, um, this comes from shale soils. The expression was just so, so much different. It was all about perfume and red fruit and um, um, you know much more most uh, uh, silkiness uh, to the wine uh, it was a lot of texture um, but packaged in a very very elegant way uh, and, and that was my you know I, I just felt that working with this variety and putting so much uh, into this variety um, this was something people that needed to see um, and um, yeah, so it, that's how the idea came to life. And um, Bierslau Wines was born in, in 2011, and 2012 was the first vintage we made uh, in the same cellar as Grand Cop, in exactly the same methods. Uh, everything everything is the same except the vineyard, and then using a small bit less new oak. I I I just felt as this wine. Um, and I love New York. If you know, um, I would rather make if I if I wanted to use 100% New Oak, I would have. Um, but I just felt the this expression of this site really works better with about 50% New Oak. With a Canon Corp, you go up to 80% New Oak. So uh, um, I just felt that that was the right uh, um, 
moment of which for this wine uh, with the wild is still the is still the focus uh, it still it still stays the focus so yeah that's uh, that's how it uh, started um so it just me and my me and my wife in in our business um and you know we started really small um, about four and a half thousand bottles the first year uh and 2018 we went up to about eighteen thousand bottles so it grew, it grew slowly but uh, we try to position it also quite accurately you know we sell in 12 different countries now and and, and hopefully the wine ends up in front of the right people like in, in this case excellent i've got a good question i should come on to from there um i do apologize i think it comes from an australian but he's asked the question i'm gonna i'm gonna pop it on the screen here for you um He's, he's asked the question, have you ever thought of blending with other reds and what's the constraints of blending? But I've got a, I've got an, another part to add on to this question afterwards. So if you could, I mean, obviously, do, do you, have you heard of Pinotage being blended with other, other grapes or? Yeah, our biggest um, volume wine is the Cadet at Canoncorp and that's blended Pinotage wine. So that's uh, you know, about 40 to 50 percent Pinotage blended with Cabernet and Merlot. Um, and it's it, it's super successful. I think we we sell close to uh, two million bottles of that annually. Um, and there's also a very a lot of successful wines out there. Carb Zucht as a as a vision. Um, you know, that wine has won the Pichon Trophy in the past uh, for the best red blended red wine. Um, so that that one takes about forty percent of the market as well. Um, and yeah, so uh, a couple of wineries like Bayersclough has a Faith, which is a small production of a blended Um Yeah, so the, that category has grown over the years, becoming quite popular. Um, but with any wine, um, I think you know it, the, the blend must be must be uh, um, better than than the components. So there must be a, a need, you know, to create a blend. Again, I don't like. Um, you know, sitting around the table and, and, and trying to, to think about new things because that's the easiest thing to, you know, to do. The challenge is to what you have to, to increase quality on that and see how you can uh, improve that. So um, we always play around, you know, if I add 10% Cabernet or 20% Cabernet uh, to Pinotage, see how that pops up. Uh, you know, it, it creates really beautiful wines. Um, but I feel with a wine like the Bierslauer, I still, the, the purity of the varietal for me is, is, the, is the focus point in this wine. And uh, so maybe in the future, uh, um, perhaps there will be a blended unit as well. But at this point, um, yeah, I, I'm. What, watch the space. I think, I think that's quite, um, you know, this week was quite a, not a, a shocking announcement, but quite a, a new announcement that um, Bordeaux is now allowed to grow six other varieties of grapes and include them under the Bordeaux label, which seems crazy. So when anyone calls their wine a Bordeaux blend, it could be as far from Bordeaux as Porto. Um, you know, they've, they've, in, they've included for the people on the on the live stream here, they've included six varieties, which, um, I mean, some of this Marceline and the Tariga National and things like that are wines, that, are grape varieties that are to me, a long way from what Bordeaux would usually produce. Um, but on that note, um, we know the USA and New Zealand and Australia also are planting pinotage and um, bottling pinotage. I think it's maybe because they can't beat us at rugby, so they're probably trying to beat us at pinotage. But um, how safe do you think your your um, you know your you as arguably the world champion of pinotage? How how long do you think before they start producing a pinotage that is of you know, great quality? Yeah, so we, we keep up to date, you know, with what's going on in, out, outside South Africa. And just for interest's sake, you know, the first uh, grapes that was planted in, in Oz was came out of South Africa. So, you know, they're always like a couple of steps behind. But, uh, you know, it's, it's good to, it's good to, there's a lot of uh, uh, quality South Africans living in Australia today and as in the UK. So, yeah. and they're supporting us well. So, uh, yeah, we won't, we won't be too harsh on them. Um, <laughs> But uh, it's uh, yeah. I think the the research when you look at uh, any any varietals of Africa, most research have gone into Pinotage, and we are a proactive organization, the Pinotage Association. Um, we you know we uh, you know we spend a lot of money on research. We try to 
keep on improving on what we know and, and also the dissemination of knowledge between other winemakers, um, you know, trying to, to, to really improve the category, not only individual mm -hmm. wines, which is, which is a great, I think, um, something you won't find in a lot of other countries, the way that, that the Pinotage winemakers and growers work together trying to improve the category. So I think, you know, they need to get there before, you know, they, they, they will catch up. But there's already some quality wines out there. You know, I've tested wines from, 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 the, from the US, which, is, which was quite impressive. Uh, I think, uh, again, um, it's a lot of its knowledge that was 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 you know found in South Africa. It was just you know used over there. But this is quality. There will be quality wines, which is not a bad thing. And I, I, I've seen in in the states people asking more for their Pinot Noir and they're asking for their Pinot Noir. And so you you need to break down the barriers. And you have to change perceptions on on uh, um, you know. And pinotage on price points, um, quality, you have to change that. Uh, and, and the rest of the world can help with that, then, you know, we're, we're happy. Um, they can struggle to, to get 63 year old pinotage vineyards. Um, so, uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's going to keep them back for a while. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, we, we're happy, you know, we, it's not a thing about trying to, you know, South Africa is full of, of French varietals. So, it's, it's the same type of thing, you know. We, Completely, yeah. Yeah, we, we just need to keep on our focus and keep on grinding on quality and, and refining what we already know. Um, I think that's our main, main, main focus. Um, coming, on to, coming on to all those French varieties that we have in South Africa, and that, um, there's a question here from Greg Page. Um, which wine growing region outside of South Africa has inspired you as a winemaker the most? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's, uh, um, you know, there's a lot of wines outside of South Africa that inspired me. Um, but the winemaking, per se, I would say, South Africa is, is pretty much um, on top of the game when it comes to technical knowledge and understanding of winemaking. Um, and and I'll say, I say that because, you know, the challenges in South Africa is really quite a lot and sometimes much more than you find in other countries. And, you know, when you look at, 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 at for instance, just the, the climate, climate change that a lot of countries are experiencing, we, we've been having this extreme weather, you know, now for, for, for 100 years. It's not something new that we've experienced. And so we're adapting quicker. Uh, you know, we've already had varietals in the soil that, that, that can handle this type of conditions better. Pinotage, luckily enough, is one of them that can handle these conditions better. But um, as, as when it comes to wines, you know, my... I, I love a, I love a, a good Riesling and a good Burgundy, uh, you know, Pinot, a proper Pinot Noir. And this is the, these are wines that we can't grow in South Africa or statistically grow the same. You know, I believe we can we do make some of the best Cabernets in the world that can compare with with the best in, in the world out there. Uh, you know, when you look at the white varietals, beautiful uh, Chenin Sauvignon Blancs. Yeah. You know, even our sparkling wine, the Cup Classics are up there with some of the best uh, champagnes in the world. Um, yeah, so, but when it comes to a Riesling, you know, from something from the Mosul or, yeah. or, or proper Burgundy, um, unfortunately, with our with our currency, the Rand, you, 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 you just read about these wines, you don't really see them often. Yeah. Um, uh, um, yeah, they they always always a pleasure to, to travel in those areas as well. You know, I think uh, when it comes to to uh, the people in these areas, we also relate relate quite a lot to them. You know, more down to earth, down to the soil. Um, yeah, so. yeah, I was um, I was very lucky. Sorry, go ahead, Aubrey. Yeah, I just I just love love uh, the the. Traveling in those areas and also love the the wines. Yeah, yeah. I was very lucky when I first obviously arrived in the UK and I was learning my my well limited knowledge on wine compared to yourself. The um one of the greatest wines I ever tasted was a, a a Pinot Noir. It was a Burgundy, and it was something that shocked me too. You know, I, I, I remember going upstairs at my lunch break saying I didn't want to have anything to eat because I didn't want to lose the taste in my mouth. But um, <laughs> there is definitely some amazing things we can learn from them. Um, yeah. One of the questions that's come across on this side here, um, when we're looking, obviously you're you're busy with the current um, the current vintage at the moment, and 2017 and 2015 for South Africa were 
unbelievably good vintages. Um, how do you know, you know, at this stage, how do you know when you've got a particularly good vintage? Um, in South Africa, again, we, we are a warm wine growing country. So normally a proper vintage or a good vintage for us means, uh, uh, you know, having a decent winter and that means cold, cold units with enough rain, which we had now in, um, perhaps not the, the, the exact amount of cold units we wanted in winter, but we had proper rain and it was, it was good. Um, then, you know, just no heat waves. That, that's already something that you know, plays a big role in our, uh, in our region. Um, you know, having temperature of, of 40 degrees for, you know, four or five days in a row can really just change the, the whole uh, vintage around. So um, we had a cool December and, and you know, I think that the, the average was about two degrees cooler, if I'm correct. Um, not too much wind, you know, you know working with bush vine, pinotage, the wind can be quite a, quite a, a, a problem. So we didn't have too much wind uh, damaging shoots, damaging the vineyards. Um, it also dries out the soil. If you work with, with uh, you know, uh, unirrigated bush vines, you know, a lot of wind really dries out the soil as well. So not too much of that. But in general, I would say cooler conditions than the long term average. Um, you know, moderate days and cool evenings. That is, that is, uh, I think, the same for everywhere in the world. Um, and um, this year we had a little bit more rain um, through the season. So that means, you know, 10 or 15 millimeters every two or three weeks, which is, which is great for the keeping the plants uh, really fresh. But uh, because of that, there was more uh, disease pressure. Uh, and so you needed to be on top of the game when it comes to, to uh, idiom and, and mildew. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, it was also a high pressure year for all the, all the bugs and stuff. Uh, they were everywhere. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, I think the cooler conditions is what we're after. And then it's just slowing down the ripening of the fruit. Um, this is the. This will be the latest we will ever. I've ever harvested uh, at Karonkop. So in, in okay. twenty harvests, this will be the latest of pink fruit, which already um, we can see in the analysis. You know, these low, low pHs. Um, you know, crop acids. Um, yeah. So we're looking forward to a unique and spectacular vintage. And you, um, you said in your your answer there that you you about your bush vines. Now we, um, you know, we have these visions in our heads as we drive through Stellenbosch wine lands and we drive through just and there are these beautiful straight lines of wire and trellis. And even at, even in the northern hemisphere, yeah, when we were planting apples, we went to wire and trellis and things like that. You do you use just bush vines for your pinotage that you you make? Um, yeah, I, I quite like the bush vines. The pinotage is quite a in unique varietal as soon as you trellis it they, it just grows much more vigorously and because of that you, you find that the bunches and the berries are, are much um, bigger uh, so you lose concentration just by the way that you grow the plant um, bush vines um, because because it's no trellises the the wind helps to control the growth of the shoots um, and also, uh, because of because you have shorter shoots, you have shorter internodes on the shoots, and because of that, it creates smaller bunches with smaller berries. So your concentration is, is, is more, your yield is lower. So it's a very natural way of the plant to get a certain balance between you know, the amount of leaves and the fruit it bears. Um, and that's something that you can't duplicate. It's something you can't. You know, go into a trellis vineyard that's quite vigorous. You can't, you know, just make it in balance with its surrounds or with, with the soil. You, uh, there's something that, that needs to be natural. Uh, that same thing happen, happens with age when you have older plants. You know, they start to bear less fruit. They, uh, they, have, they have less, they have less vigor. Um, and with bush vines, I think we find that quite, quite quickly um, early on in the plant's life. And, and what's, um, I remember visiting uh, the Bollinger in Champagne and they had their, their VA Vien vineyard with a, you know, it's a small, small, um, walled vineyard and that I couldn't believe how small it was. But the age of these bush vines, what sort of age are the bush vines that you're picking from? You said 65 years. Are these the original? Yeah. 1941 or? 
the oldest, oldest uh, vineyards we work with is 60, or the Pinotage, 67 years old. Um, that is, uh, um, I think the oldest Pinotage vineyard still, that, that still harvested is 40, uh, was planted 48. So that's another, that will be about 82 years old, I think. Um, yeah. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, so amazing. it's uh, 72 years, sorry, 72 yeah. years old. Uh, so it's still, it's uh, you know, it's it, it's a it's because it's a young young variety. That that's that's very old. You know, the third yeah. the peanut was the cross. The, the, the grape was created in 1924 when Professor Perrault he took the pollen from the Pinot Noir plant and he put it on the flower of the of the Senso plant that called Hermit Hermitage at that time or Hermitage as as in yeah. plants. Um, but so he took the pollen and he, and he cross pollinated it and and then he bro broke away all the other um, what do you call it stems or uh, my English is not that accurate but uh, he took it yeah. couldn't pollinize itself and and then the berries developed from that cross pollination and the seeds inside was the was the new pinotar seeds that was planted and that was done that 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 happened that seeds was was produced in 1925 and then when you take in into consideration that the first commercial pinotar was only made in 1959 <laughs> it's still very very young for for a varietal um but we had we had plantings on kanonkop already in the 40s because um, the first people that planted pinotage was um, City de Val from from uh, um, in uh, uh, Pierre Morkel from Bellevue at that stage and, and Paul Sauer. They were the first guys to plant pinotage and that was still very experimental back in the 40s. Um, uh, and then the first commercial pinotage was done in 1959 was under Lanzarac label. It was, was owned by Stellenbosch Farmers Winery back in those days. Um, and there was wines used from Canonkop and Bellevue and some other estates back in those years. It was used in the in the early Lanzarote Pinotages. Um, yeah. So, so um, just coming on to you, you were talking about the young, young sides, but um, I've got a message, I've got a, a question here from Jason. Uh, Jason, um, Quite amazed you can understand us both because he always gives me a bit of grief for my south african accent and um, jason spent some time in south africa so he still does love south africa i know that uh, but he's asking the question anything you should know we should know about regarding laying down kind of couple beers like i mean my immediate my immediate response would be you know I'm, i prefer to drink the wines reasonably young um, but what are you what's your viewpoint Aubrey? yeah i i think there's few things for me more rewarding than a properly aged vintage and I had the I had the privilege to taste you know from back from fifty nine from the earliest pinotages I've tried you know early sixty sixty three zona blooms it was it's still in still fantastic condition you know uh, through the years so we had a, a, the opportunity and and I must say pinotage it ages extremely well um, but again it, it it is a variety where you find that definitely two groups of 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 um, of I would say uh, pinotage consumers. So the one group do like the, the freshness and the the, the, you know, the, uh, uh, the young fruit that you you find and, and, and the plushness of, of a young pinotage. And and then you have you know other group that's looking for that that um, secondary characteristics. You know, the forest floor and the earthiness and the mushroom. And you definitely do get more. Um, you know, it moves, if it's a proper pinotage, it moves more closer to Pinot Noir in, in time. So, you know, if you taste the 91 Canon Cop now, the wine is still one of the benchmark wines from, from this property for me that I've tasted over, over the years. And uh, um, it's still fantastic condition, you know, 99 Pinotage, um, unbelievable wine. And you, you put that wine blind in any, you know, you know wine, a knowledgeable wine person and they will know they don't know what they drink they know they're, they're having fun but they don't know what they're drinking because it's just a quality wine and, and saying that i think that's the way we we are moving with pinotage as well is that we are not focusing on trying to make pinotage we're trying to make quality wine first and that means 
the same for anyone I believe in the world, which is structure and balance and length and uh, um, you know finesse. You know, there's there's certain words I like to use when it comes to any quality wine in the world. Um, and, and I think for a certain period, some some areas so they've they've moved away from that, um, trying to create styles of wine that will be a bit more obvious or a bit more uh, uh, successful, you know, and, 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 and that's, uh, that's something you have to be careful uh, about. And uh, same, same with Pinotage, I think you have to focus on, on quality red wine first and, and the rest will follow. You know, it's made from the Pinotage grape, the, 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 ry the rival characteristics will show. But coming back to the question, um, laying down the wines, uh, Again, if you like it young, I would say, you know, uh, keep it at least a year or two um, in, in the bottle. Um, I'm, I'm, I've opened the 2019 now because that's what we, what we are currently selling. So I, oh. I just I wanted to have, we have a real look at it because it's uh, just gone into the market recently. And uh, um, just to see how, you know, because every couple of months the wine shows itself, especially at this young age. Um, but when you look at the 2018 that you guys already have on that side, it's uh, it's the wine is is voluptuous. It is it is open. It's friendly. It's it's accessible, uh, and it offers a lot. Um, well, how will it change in 10 years from now? I think you know, um, you know that that effortless. You know, when you when you drink a wine, you don't know how you finish the bottle. That type of thing. <laughs> of, of effortless has become with time and and. And, and the, you know the primary fruit, it will it, uh, um, it changes to more to a, almost more red or open type of fruit, and and then with that the characteristics of truffle and you know uh, more savouriness comes through as well, which makes for a more complex experience uh, if you can put it that way. Young pinotage can be quite difficult sometimes for people to understand, understand because they have no reference. But when you drink yeah. a ten or fifteen year old pinotage. There's some of those characteristics that's recognizable, you know, like a stick uh, with the noir. Yeah, and that's exactly what I was going to say. The, the nose on the, the older pinotages I've had, that, that floralness and the fragrance, I, you know, that the dark fruit fragrance really comes through. And that I think those, those are amazing things for the aged. But I like that sort of greenness on the palate as well. I've got another, I've got another question here from, um, I've got a question from Craig. I'll pop it up on the screen for you. Um, so obviously with all the, the weather and that you spoke about, how do you protect against extreme forecasts when you're growing wines like a heat wave? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I, I always, you, you prepare as, as well as you can. Um, and you you try to make your, your plants, you know, um, um, as, as healthy and as, as, as prepared as possible. And uh, there's a couple of things that we do around this. The first thing that, that you must do is, is try to figure out, and, and, I'm, and I'm talking now specifically from a point of view, you have to uh, figure out what's supposed to grow on your, on your piece of land or your piece of earth that you work with. Um, you know, in South Africa in the past, we were never uh, uh, restricted by what we could grow, where we want to grow it, uh, the yields, etc. You could You can plant Sauvignon Blanc next to Cabernet, Next to your Chardonnay, you know that that was all was all allowed, and um, and over the years people saw, but listen, consistently um, the you know these varietals don't all do the same in, in the same area. So um, at Canoncop, we are lucky that we've figured this out over the years um, with the help of Jan Boland Kutsia and Bayer Stritte, you know guys that's gone through the ranks and, and, and saw, listen, the shares did not work on this property and the Chardonnay and the Pinot Noir and et cetera didn't work. So we ended up with the right varietals for the site. So that means we're going to get consistently better quality um, wines because it's the right right vineyards for this for this site and the same for the Bierslau vineyard. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, if you have the right vineyard on the right side, it, that will handle the conditions better. Um, then the next thing that's important, like I said, is keeping trying to get your your your, your, your vineyards as healthy as possible. Um, and you know, and we do a lot of work nowadays with cover crops, 
trying to you know get like a type of a mulch on the on the soil that you you keep the moisture in you know you you get better root development uh, the the structure and the texture of the soil improves um, you know when it rains the water goes into the soil it doesn't just run off so um, that's one of the one of the, the, the second things that we are focusing on a lot and then also yields i think you know not being focused too much on, on trying to get as much as possible grapes every year but rather trying to get the best quality so our average yields throughout is about five tons a hectare um you know if you ask a, a, a normal south african grower you know they say you're crazy you can't you know can't survive on five tons a hectare so uh but our focus is quality and and and, and unfortunately to a certain extent you know that 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 also push up the prices of the wines um but you know if that's if you, if you ask me you know 10 times i, I would rather go for quality uh and, and try to best make the best possible wine that you can make you know we only as winemakers we only have so much opportunities i've i've been at canon corp now 20 years and the bslr is now what, about eight years uh, in the in the making and you know, you, you already feel you're running out of time. So uh, <laughs> yeah. you have to do it properly and you have to do it right. Um, totally. I totally agree. The, um, there was a recent article on uh, Tim Atkins, who's obviously one of the biggest uh, reviewers of South African wine, I think. Um, but he was saying about, the, you know, instead of looking for the next new thing, let's concentrate on what we do now. And as you said earlier, you know, just getting becoming a master of what you're doing at the moment, I think is amazing. And there's so much that we haven't discovered in the world that is currently happening that I think, you know, there's, there's so much more for us to look at. Um, I've got there's a couple, another question there from Greg that I'm going to pull up now. But one of the questions, I think, you know, from a, just from an everyday sort of point of view, I always used to get it um, in the wine shop when I worked in, in London. I mean, Her and of all places, it was Harrods. But I used to get people coming and ask me, what's the difference between a, you know, five-pound bottle of wine and what's the difference between a hundred-pound bottle of wine? Um, so if you put that in your in your money, we're talking, you know, is it it's a hundred rand bottle of wine or a thousand rand bottle of wine? And I I used to try and explain to them, you know, what you know, why these wines are more expensive. And you've you've touched on it a little bit there with obviously yields, but from a producer's point of view, you guys put in so much time and effort. I and mean, how would you how would you explain that to to the everyday consumer? Yeah, it's you know. I would, I would say the the effort the, you know the cost involved all of that is 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 important but when you get to a certain you know a high price product then it's about a unique expression that you can offer and that's something that you know you can't duplicate anywhere else that's something you it doesn't matter where you open a bottle of wine you know uh, you won't be able to, to duplicate that experience and, and so it's it's, it's uh, more than just um you know, trying to convert it into cost, how much the vineyards, the barrels, the, the winemaking, et cetera, cost. And you have to go beyond that and say, listen, this is how, how much are you prepared to spend for that experience? Because there's only, you know, of the BSLR, is only 17,000 of those experiences available of that vintage. And uh, and that go, have to go throughout the world. Um, and, and, and I think that's what you, that's where the price point starts to become, um, I would, say, I would say gray, but much more yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, competitive. <laughs> I think the um, I think I would I was at a well, I think it was London London wine show in Excel probably about close to twenty years ago, and there was a French chap there who um who pulled out a, a small small bottle and he he gave it for us to taste and I asked him what it was and it was a 19, 1937 Armagnac that was buried through the Second World War and you could taste the earthiness of it. And you know that's something that I wanted to take back to the people that asked me that question and say, you know, tell me what you would what you would value that at because these are sort of things that are priceless. But um, absolutely, yeah, spot on with there's, that. There's some, you know, there's some growers over the years and through the world that have tried to to make wine expensive by, you know, using just super expensive materials, using barrels three or four times new oak in the process of making the wine you know um those stories i don't know one of them has really become super successful um because it's it's all it's all it can all be duplicated it's just a story yeah. it's not 
it's, it's, not, it's not real. So what's real is, is a specific vineyard and grown on a specific site that gives a unique experience that you can't duplicate anywhere else. You, know, you just need to look at Romani Conti to, to really you know, understand and, uh, and what people are prepared to pay for that. So I want to I wanna touch, you know, I, I don't know how much time I've left. I just want to touch, I think we talked about earlier um, the, you know, the price difference. Um, so when it comes to South African wine and thousand rand, you know, compared to getting some of the best wines in the world at a thousand rand, which is what, 50 pounds, you know, it is still, it's still not um, where we're supposed to be. Um, and, and when you look back at the 70s, and I'm always so surprised when you look at um, um, Jan Bolland, which he still has a lot of Petrus and stuff in his cellar. And these are wines that he bought and it could afford back in the 70s as a South African. Um, you know, and, and they were they bought them, I think, for 10 or 20 Rand a bottle. And they were not like this super expensive compared to you know, today, what we see in, in, in the world. And there's a couple of reasons for that, why South Africa is, you know, and I, I and I, I don't want to use the word value for money anymore because it's it's you know it's killing our industry. This whole value for money thing. Um, but back in those days, South Africa wines were priced much closer to international standards or, or quality. Um, then during the, the times of sanctions, you know we were we were, I think, uh, just you know selling wine in rand to our to our friends and. and local people and um the, the the rand really devaluated in that period of time and uh, um and also the other thing that happened is back in 94 so when sanctions was left there we could get back into the international arena i think we didn't have enough confidence to ask these high prices compared to what was asked in the rest of the world um you know and and then we positioned ourselves as cheap um cheap in value but not cheap in quality um and and that's why i think we messed it up ourselves so we've been clawing back and fighting back trying to get back where south african wine is perceived price point wise uh, in, in the same in the same level compared to the us or france or, or other parts of the world but it's been an uphill battle and we are um we are partly responsible for that um, the quality is there like i said Back in the 70s, people were prepared to pay for South African wine, similar prices compared to the rest of the world. But nowadays, um, you know, you get a, it's really a bargain buying South African wine. Um, because the quality is still there, the price has just been, you know, buggered up. Nuts, yeah. Um, I think we might have, we've, we seem, we've got some messages that some people have been cut off, but they might have just dropped some things off, off the, of the time there um what I'm, we will this will keep recording and it'll be live it'll be available to review anyway so there's a couple of questions i'm, I'm really conscious of time for you to Aubrey, because it's um it's nine it's now 10 to 10 in south africa but um one question that came in from greg i think i think was um quite poignant um if pinotage was no longer a grape you could choose to make wine which variety would you choose to focus on <laughs> yeah it's a uh... You know, again, depends on where I'm in, in, in my area I'm currently in. I would probably, I would definitely focus on, on Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, it's a varietal that I already work with quite a lot. And, and it's, uh, when you look throughout the world, it's a variety that's, uh, I think, has, has, has reached the, the, the highest levels of quality and understanding and, and, and yeah, so it is. It's a it's a variety that I, I love to work with. Um, it's really rewarding, uh, but it's a true reflection of sight for me. With Pinotage, I can I can still interfere a lot in the winemaking process and, and, and contribute. Um, that's why I also call Pinotage the winemaker's grape. But with Cabernet, it's all about sight. It's all about terroir. It's about. Yeah. I, I, I sometimes I laugh about how little you can do to it. You know, it's just. If it's if it's the vintage isn't good, if the site isn't right, you can do nothing. The, the wine won't uh, be of the best possible quality. But if everything works together, you know there's no there's, there's few grapes as 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 great as, as Cabernet. 
the um, and, and even in, in fantastic vintages, I I like to do Cabernet as clean as possible. I don't want to blend uh, you know anything with it in, in lesser vintages. Then you know uh, a Merlot, Cab Franc, etc. contributes a lot to to Cabernet, small percentages even. Um, but yeah, Cabernet, um, and then on the white side, I. I, I, I want to do a Chardonnay. I think uh, I've been drinking uh, much more so local South Chardonnay South Africa, but it's it's a, it's a rival for me that um, yeah I, I think it's it's something I would like to make and um, yeah, let's see perhaps in the future. Would you go the Merso side, heavily oaked, or would you stick to the unoaked side? Or no, somewhere in between. You know, it's uh, I like I said I like oak, and as long as it contributes to the wine. Um, if the wine, the structure is there. Uh, I, I like the, I like the, the uh, you know, when, when you get the purity and you get that, that you know, really uh, um, the complexity between the, the minerality, the citrus, yeah. the, the viscosity on the palate, you know, you get all of that right. It's, it's uh, something I, I enjoy. Perfect. And there's, there's, they, they do the, they do that in France. You know, the, there's lots of wines that I know there's a Chardonnay that sit right in the middle. So there's lots more to be discovered. Um, yeah. One of the questions that I'll quickly pop on to you is, um, would would you ever drink Pinotage chilled? I, I I can show mine is just in the fridge now. So I ah there you go. And it's South it's South Africa, so. Uh, Chill is probably your room temperature right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's your second penalty of the night because you mentioned the weather twice. <laughs> no, it's, uh, um, yeah, I think uh, what's really interesting and, and, and I think worth trying is, uh, um, is doing pinotage chilled with different types of foods. Uh, you know, you, you'll see perhaps normal temperature and if you have one pinotage chilled, you'll see that the tenants becomes almost softer and, and, and they start to, to disappear and the acid becomes a bit more pronounced. So um, even with seafood, you know, uh, a chilled pinotage goes really well with that. Um, yeah, so I, I, I do like to, I do like to chill down the wine, especially in our conditions. You know, yeah. if you go sit at the patio and you start at just the right temperature, it will heat up quickly uh, and, 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 you know, you need to put in a cool, you know, Chilled uh, or in ice or something, just to keep the temperature as close as right as possible. And that and that sort of temperature, we, we, used, to, we used to so we used to we used to sort of aim for about 15 degrees Celsius. So that's the the optimum. We used to, we used to look at that's a Euro carb temperature. Is that about right? About 15 degrees C. Yeah, I will go between 15 and 17 is, is for me a good temperature to drink Pinotage. Um, but I, like I said, you can go down to 12 degrees. You'll you'll find that the wine offers different um, offers a different experience at slightly lower temperatures. Amazing, Aubrey. I'm so conscious of time. It's been absolutely amazing, um, and I can't I can't thank you so much. Um, if there's anything um, anything you would like to say, just to close off. Yeah, I, I sorry, I, I I was just scanning through the the, the messages. I think there's a lot of people or questions I perhaps we didn't get to. I just want to say hi to my mate Kerry Lego. I saw him quickly. I think he wanted some wine as well or something like that. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I just want to say a quick hi and all the guys that tuned in. Thanks a lot. Uh, um, hopefully, in the near future, when we can travel again, we can do a face to face up uh, in in in. In, uh, in London or, or, or surrounds. Uh, um, yep. Yeah, we keep posted and yeah, thank you for the support. I think, you know, all of you are conscious also of what's going on in South Africa. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's a challenge. It still stays a, it's still an unbelievable country, but it's, it's, it's a challenging country that, uh, and, and we need all the support that we can get. So thanks a lot for that. And yeah, and thank you for the opportunity. And so honored to have you on. And again, from Danon and myself and BFA, thank you so much for all the, you know, releasing your wines to us and allowing us to sell them on this side. Um, your support is massively appreciated. Um, and thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so that so that's it, everyone on the on the live chat on the right. That's winemaker session number one. 
I'm not sure how I'm going to beat this, but thank you so much, Aubrey. And um, we'll catch up. I'm hoping to be in Stellenbosch um, in May. My wife's probably on the chat, so she'll probably ask May, question mark, because um, I'm, still, I'm still planning on coming. Um, but the, hopefully we'll catch up in May. And then if London Wine Show in May as well, if you're this side. I'm not sure if you're coming to pick up your fourth award. So Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll stack the wood up for the fire so long. So, yeah, I'll, I'll see you in May then. Amazing. Thank you so much. And that's it. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Winemaker session number one, all done and dusted. Over and out. Cheers, people. Yes.